Motorsport is a very quick sport, not only in terms of performance, but also in regulation changes. It very much depends on the technological involvement, and it is important to give everybody the same chance of winning. The same applies to engine parameters, which are changed a lot, and often we see new types of engines just after a few years. However, there was an engine that survived over two decades basically under the same formula. The 1960s were interesting times for Formula One. The decade began with a regulation allowing for a 1.5 litre engine at most, down from 2.5 litres. Lotus was successfully using a Coventry Climax cross-plane V8 between 1961 and 1965, but in that year, Fiat decided to increase the engine displacement to 3 litres. Coventry Climax ended the collaboration with Lotus there, and Colin Chapman instantly approached Cosworth for help. They agreed to develop a competitive 3-litre engine, but it was up to Chapman to find a £100,000 budget. It may not sound like much, but in 2022 money, it would be over 2.6 million US dollars. He approached Ford and Aston Martin for funding, but after a negative answer, he tried to pull strings on Ford from a different side through British PR chief Walter Hayes and eventually received consent from Detroit. The goal was to combine power, simplicity, lightweight and reliability into a single package. Yeah, that's pretty much what everybody else aims for, but Cusworth actually managed to do it. The car was made of aluminum to deliver low weight. The 90-degree V8 block introduced a relative simplicity and reasonable compact footprint. An over-squared cylinder ratio, as well as the twin cams with four-valve setup, brought power to desired levels. To reach 2,993cc, the engine had 85.67 by 64.9mm cylinders, allowing for healthy size 34.5mm inlet and 29mm outlet valves. There was a forged steel crankshaft on five main bearings, steel rods and aluminum pistons with a gear-driven valve train and a Lucas mechanical indirect fuel injection. The whole technology was not particularly new, but the DFE was put together in an unstoppable way. Also, its crankshaft was flat plane, but the sound of the DFE was incredibly throaty and sweet. <laughs> Compared to the other engines, it brought about double the power with 408 horsepower at 9000 rpm and 370 Nm of torque. By the way, the DFV stands for double four valve, basically a further development of early four cylinders which also had four valves per cylinder. The DFV was introduced yet in 1965 but was not ready until the third event in the 1967 season in Zandvoort. A Lotus 49 was the first car to use it, having the engine as a chassis stress-bearing member. With Graham Hill behind the wheel, he qualified for a pole position with a half a second to spare and led for 10 laps until a valve train gear failed. His teammate Jim Clark managed to make his way onto the first position and win the race. Team Brabram Repco was a series rival who eventually won the season, but others struggled. The Ferrari was overweight with less power. BRM 16 cylinder was too complex, heavy and unreliable. The Maserati and Westlake also suffered from poor reliability and the Honda was at 600 kilos. Others were around 560, but an 11% lighter DFE powered Lotus 49 won every pole position and the party was just getting started. The failed gear showed up as an anomaly and the DFE seemed incredibly reliable. By the end of the 1967 season, Ford executives concluded that to not look silly winning easily with a brand new engine, they explained to Chapman that Lotus no longer had a monopoly to use the DFV and they will offer it for sale. At the 2022 price of 184,000 US dollars, French Matra immediately called this opportunity and many others followed. McLaren, Brabham, March, Surtees, Tyrell, Heskeith, Lola, Williams, Penske, Wolf, 
and Liga are some of the teams using the DFB. Between 1967 to 1986, 155 races out of 262 were won by a DFB-powered car, and every race during the 1969 and 1973 seasons were dominated by the British engine. In 1977, a ground effect was a major thing, which prolonged the lifespan of the DFB, as its cylinders and heads were at the 90-degree angle and far above the ground. It left space for the aerodynamic effect to take place, which was not possible with Italian flat valves by Ferrari and Alfa Romeo. Many believed that the Italians would crush everybody thanks to the lower center of gravity, but it did not happen, and DFE cars were still competitive somehow, even in the late 1970s and early 1980s, thanks to the perfect underbody aero. However, it was also the time when turbocharged engines were emerging, as they were still allowed to participate. Renault and Ferrari attempted to compete with the 1.5 litre V6s, and although they were much more powerful in theory, they were hindered by high weight, worse reliability, not as great aero because of more engine parts, and terrible throttle response. The turbocharged F1s were able to take advantage of the extra power at high altitude tracks, but the sharp and instant throttle response of the DFE could not kill the old Ford engine just yet, being dominant on narrow, twisty and even high corner speed tracks, benefiting from the better ground effect. That was between 1977 and 1982 when turbocharged engines were just getting started and the DFE could still keep up thanks to the incredible recipe from the beginning. Moreover, the recipe was further improved in a form of the DFY variant. A Cosworth engineer, Mario Ilien, changed the cylinder ratio by 16% in favor of a wider bore, allowing the engine to rev more freely. The valve angle was also narrower, there were I-type conrods replaced by the H-type ones, and a weight shaved by 27 kilos. <laughs> DFY's peak power raised to 520 horsepower at 11,200 rpm, which was however still a lot lower compared to the turbos. It was put into racing in 1983 and achieved its final victory, symbolically, at the Detroit Grand Prix. It was in use up until 1985, but then Cosworth decided to place their efforts into the GBA V6 turbo development. Unexpectedly, it was still not the end. In 1986, the turbo band was announced to be valid since 1989 and Cosworth aimed to tide small teams over with a temporary solution in a form of a DFZ, a 3.5-litre DFE variant making 583 horsepower. By 1988, it was making nearly 600 horsepower, but then a DFR variant came along. It was the most powerful NA engine on the grid in 1988, with as much as 630 horsepower. However, the turbos were still up by 5% in horsepower, and the new 1989 V10s and V12s were in a similar power range too. The DFR ended with about 639 horsepower, 63% over the initial output of the DFE. <laughs> The engine was used in various other variants in the North American racing series with mediocre results. Last but not least, Norton approached Cosworth about whether they could work together on a twin-cylinder DFE engine for motorcycle racing. It had to have a single carburetor, hence it was a 360-degree firing unit with 750cc of displacement. The gear drive was swapped for a belt, but a vibration-fighting, counterbalancing system made the engine incredibly heavy. It weighed 88 kilograms, 35 of which were the moving parts, and with 90 horsepower, not even the targeted 100 horsepower output was reached. In the end, the underpowered, overweight, and unreliable P86 twin cylinder was like a bad dream in comparison to lightweight, sharp Japanese engines. The Cosworth DFE is one of the most successful racing engines ever, and most definitely the longest living in Formula 1. Hundreds of them were built between 1967 and 1993, which was the last year it raced. An astonishing achievement by Cosworth, creating an engine that was competitive for over a quarter of a century. 
It truly was an interesting era, even with crazy monsters like the six-wheeled Tyrell P-34 using the DFV. 